thank you, Neil, for the introduction, and um, to Chloe Garner and all those who work on Letbury Poetry Festival, um, which is one of my favourites. Um, I wanted uh, to read mostly from the second half of the book because um, I tend not to read from, from the second half because uh, I don't know why, really. Uh, so I'm going to read more or less straight through the second half, but I'll start with the poem that I usually begin with, which is the very first poem in the book, which is called The Colour of James Brown's Scream. Um, this poem is for Todd Bracey and Steve McCarthy. Steve McCarthy is my friend Karen's brother, um, and uh, I told Karen I was writing a poem about the DJ Larry Levan, and she said, you've got to speak to my brother because he used to go uh, to Larry Levan's club night in the 70s in New York. Um, and I spoke to Steve and he said, I'm, I'm not a poet exactly, but here are some of my thoughts. And he wrote this uh, long kind of stream of consciousness um, and some of his, his words and phrases and descriptions of that time and some of Todd's are also in this poem. The Colour of James Brown's Scream I have known you by many names, but today you are Larry Levan, your hand on the platter in the smoky room of a garage regular's memory. You're keeping when doves cry in time as you swing your hips and sweat drips from your hair the colour of James Brown's scream, King of King Street. We're still moving to the same sound, though some of us don't know it is your grave we dance on. Cutting shapes, machismo lost to the beat. Every roadman is a sweet boy if the DJ plays heartbroken at just the right time for these jaded feet. Teach us to shapeshift, legba. You must know I'd know your customary shuffle that phantom limp anywhere, that I see your hand in the abandon of a couple, middle of the floor, sliding quick and slick as a skin fade by the hand of a Puerto Rican clipper man who wields a cutthroat like a paintbrush. Let us become like them, an ode to night, ordering beer in a corporeal language from a barman who replies by sweeping his arms in an arc, Willy Ninja style. To fix a drink our lips will yearn for, a taste we've been trying to recreate ever since. I want to read, um, I want to read this poem, which is for, for my niece, uh, who I spent some time with recently after not having seen her for a while. When she hasn't seen us for a while, she gets very excited in our company, but that means that we can't actually interact with her. She, um, <laughs> she runs into sofas, jumps off them, runs around, runs away. It's intense <laughs> for, for someone who's as, um, as, as laid back in day-to-day -day life as I am. But I've had to access an internal hyperactivity. <laughs> um, this is called Malumbo. Malumbo is a kind of um, a celebration, almost like a praise song for somebody, either when they're born or when they die, or some formative moment in their life. Malumbo for Malaika. Your parents rejected my suggestion. I told them you could pull off Ethel. The jury is still out. Alicia, out of the question. Ditto Shaniqua and Chantel. I have a soft spot for Dambisa, Malaika, or Mambwe. But whatever you were called, you should know we've all been waiting for your birthday. The look on your face as you apprehend snow. I hope you hold on to your wonder, that you'll never grow so stiffly poised, a scent or song is not enough to conjure that smile of yours, the fullness of your voice. 
I mentioned um, I mentioned the word the phrase skin fade in the poem I read earlier. Um, skin fade is one of my favourite things in the world. It's a it's a term from the cutting of hair, whereby you move from baldness to hair in a smooth transition. Um, and I was thinking about the the ways in which this book having to do with um, formative moments and coming of age. I was thinking of the ways in which we would mark ourselves out as, as, as young men. And a wonderfully executed skin fade was always a mark of great respectability in my circles. Um, and this is a celebration of that. It's called Waves. The year waves came in. When we sang your sweet like chocolate boy without shame. Everyone had a method for taming even the most rebellious head of pepper grains into slick, crazy paved deference to R&B stars, looming large from hoardings, pasted into diaries and exercise books, their lyrics written out on the backs of hands. We wanted to be wanted like that. So we slept with our mother's head wraps tight to keep the facade in place. Some taught themselves the grace of clippers so they could tidy up their edges in the bathroom mirror. Others sought the counsel of barbers, technicians of the razor blade who could elevate a trim to a thing of head-turning, transcendent beauty. But for all we tried to hide our stubble, ashamed of the hair's natural grain. It came back, unbidden, as if each follicle knew that soon we would covet shade lines in sideburns, eyebrows, anything to set ourselves apart, betray our roots. I often ask if there are any basketball fans in the audience, which in this country is just not, <laughs> it's not a fruitful question. On occasionally, you'd be surprised there are weird pockets of basketball fanaticism. But I don't know if Ledbury is one. <laughs> but anyway, um, if anybody is a basketball fan, this is specifically for you. For everybody else, I'll try and make it... I mean, it's not that hard to understand. Um, it's based on a game called Horse that in basketball you play in order to become better at shooting, mostly. Um, you usually play with two people or three. Um, and the idea behind the game is whoever starts tries to, to make a basket that is so skillful that the person following them cannot match that same exact manner of scoring. Um, and this is complicated slightly in this poem by the fact that I'm, I'm, I'm playing horse with somebody who no longer exists. August. Each of us in shorts. A white tee. This warmth has brought the ballers out in force and though he's been dead since 1993, my father and I play a game of horse. Next to us, a group of friends play three on three backed by biggies elegant contortions to better demonstrate the importance of style. I stop, push off from my right knee, willing the flick of my wrist to yield the sort of gorgeous arc that's talked about for weeks. The rim gives back the sound of falling short. I pass the ball to the top of the key. Tata throws up a fadeaway and scores. I can't match him and collect the letter E. I should have said actually that it's kind of like hangman. Every time you can't match the shot you get a different letter. Some people play horse, some people play chump, some people play loser. Uh, it's, it's good fun, it's good fun. Good for the ego. Um, I just read maybe uh, Maybe three more poems to finish here. I mentioned that I would go back a little bit, and, and so this is me going back. This is a poem called Broom Hall. Um, Broom Hall is an area of Sheffield where I lived as an undergraduate. Um, 
in Sheffield, not Broom Hall. I lived very near to it. Um, but Broom Hall was fun because it was where I would go to have nostalgic moments. Um, mostly around the purchasing of certain kinds of food, which hadn't caught on in other districts of Sheffield. Uh, particularly the student districts, which had loads of kind of organic vegetable shops, which were great, but didn't have the stuff I wanted, which some of which had never been involved in any natural process whatsoever. <laughs> I really love drinks that are purple <laughs> and blue. Um, broom Hall. In light of what my aunt calls the Arabic texture of my hair, I'm Abdi outside the only shop selling tamarind balls, Irish moss, super malt in decent quantities. It is not enough to say I miss the smell of cassava roasted over open coals, expeditions in want of tilapia, capenta, assorted meats of questionable provenance. How much, auntie? Butter and bluff and rough hands of stall holders glazed to a deep blue, shameless blackness that is consigned now to another life before this one of middle-class white boys in reggae bands who love roots and culture as if their love is enough to know the code that some of us live and die by. At least these boys who call me Abdi seem to be fond of Abdi. They ask why I don't come round no more, what it's like it needs. And maybe, today, I can be Abdi, and this shop can be all the home I need. I just want to greet Senny if you just walked in. I love I mentioned Leeds in that poem, Senny's from Leeds. It's just a, it's a magical arrangement that we, that we made. Um, <laughs> this is... Um, this is a poem in celebration of my cousin and my cousin's friends. Um, I have the distinction of being within my particular family unit, the youngest, and that means that I've been influenced in loads of great ways by people older than me. But also, um, it means that instead of hanging out with my own friends, I would sometimes hang out with their friends, um, which was very much my experience between the ages of kind of 15 and 17 hanging around with my cousin Katai and all of his friends who at that time were really interested in, um, in garage and grime and DJing and MCing and so I would be observing and saving it for later as it turns out. Um, this is a poem called Winter Song. Uh, 2002. Raps Hasty, K-Star, JD, Sickness, Ashley, and me. Standing in the cold outside Smokester's house. Smokester is the only one we know who owns a copy of Snowman, Wiley Cat's latest white label. I remember this as my bus goes past what was once the Matapan, now dubbed the Beacon Tree to rid itself of infamy. This being the same spot where Charles Butler was chased round his car by a gunman, shot and collapsed in the road. The songs we wanted to hear lived on tapes of pirate radio sets or in the first hand crackle of vinyl from boogie times or rhythm division. When Snowman starts up, I'm back there in the Arctic north of boyhood lost in the moment just before the bass drops. Um, and I'll finish with a teeny tiny poem right at the end of the book. This is a poem called For Those Orphaned Late in Life. What if the wind blowing through the French doors of your childhood is the house's way of saying goodbye, and when you call out, answering yourself, greeting the gone out of habit, 
you hear for the first time the timbre of your voice, how someone else 